Okay, we have been, in the last several weeks, we have been learning what the board has been doing since March. Our board, half of them are brand new, and um, half of them uh, were voted in from years past. And we have been reading a book called Simple Church, kind of getting us back to the basics of why do churches exist? Why do we exist here at First Church of the Nazarene on 28th and S in Sacramento? Why do we exist? I'm going to repeat just a little bit of this for the sake of those that are fairly new and hearing this message. But we came up with a plan after reading, after praying, after a lot of discussion, we boiled down our new vision, why we exist at First Church. Why does God want us to be a church gathering here in Sacramento to four things? We connecting with God and with other people through worship of God, growing spiritually, loving others, and serving faithfully. Those four areas we see from Scripture, what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it. That's why our messages have been all about this. This is our identity as children of God, in the family of God, and how he uses us in the community where we live, where we work, where we go outside these four walls. Okay? We all get that? Okay. So to connect in God by worshiping God, there's a certain way. It's not singing songs, but songs can be used to convey our worship of him. It's not just by giving of our finances to the work of the church, but it can be expressed that way. It should be expressed that way. It's not just by opening up the word. It's opening up the word, reading it, studying it, understanding it, growing in it, and then going out and living it, practicing it in our everyday lives. It's all of those things. But it's the heart and the core of worship that we're talking about. If we had no speaking voice, if we didn't have arms or legs, you can still worship. You can worship. Without these things, you can worship without an instrument, although it's beautiful with an instrument. But that's not what God's talking about. He's talking about here. This, the core of who you are. Because if you are sold out, 100% sold out, surrendered to Jesus Christ, we sang it this morning, your expressions of worship are received from him because you're doing it from a pure heart. You're thanking him for who he is and what he's done through Jesus Christ and his blood on the cross to save us and for what he's going to do in the days, the weeks, the months, the years, however many days we have left. That's worship. And you can do that wherever you are. As a matter of fact, the most pure worship is probably when you're all alone, nobody else is around. And you have that pure, simple worship. You and Jesus. You and Jesus. Mine is when I'm cleaning my house, and I'm scrubbing the floor, and I'm singing the songs, and I've got a heart attitude of worship to him, thanking him for all the little tiny things that he's done in my life to provide for my existence, and to provide for me to honor him. There's times in your life that are different than mine. Your times of worship. It should be a constant attitude and flow of worship from your heart to him. That's what pure worship is. And then, if you truly worship him, you're going to grow spiritually. You're going to grow spiritually. We talked about the four different ways to do that. By being in the Word of God, not just reading, studying, meditating, pondering it, talking with another person about what do you think this scripture means, growing in that, and then having that constant, consistent prayer life, that communing with God, the conversation with God. It's part talk, it's part listening, and it's also part just being in His presence, being still and knowing that He's God. That's a psalm being still and know that he's God and you are not. 
And another way is by tithing. Giving up your right to the money that's in your bank account. Because you know what? It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. He allowed you to work or have a resource for your income to come in, for you to survive on this planet Earth. And it belongs to him. And he's asking for a tenth part, which is Hebrew for tithe. And he's asking for that tithe to help the operation of the local body so we can reach the lost and we can grow disciples. That's what that's used for. Amen? Amen. And then the last one was fellowshipping. We need each other. We discovered last week we need each other. I need John. I need you. You need me. You need you. You need you. We need each other to hold each other accountable and to help us to grow, to pray, to encourage, and to live this life that God's called us to do because it's not always easy. We need each other. One person isolated by themselves can get off track very easily and not even know they're off track. We need each other to hold us accountable in the word. Amen? Amen. So, we do those things, and the evidence of those four things I just talked about is this, so that we can take on the image of Christ, the one that we worship. It says this in Romans 8.29, For from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him, those who have a personal relationship with God through Jesus, should become like his son. We should look like Jesus. Jesus. And every day we should look a little more like Jesus. That's the spiritual growth we're talking about. If you are obeying him, if you are growing spiritually, there will be fruit. There will be evidence in our lives that we've spent intentional time with Christ because we're beginning to look like him. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit. If Jesus is in here, you've invited him in. The Holy Spirit comes in, takes up residence. And remember the fruit of the Spirit? If you know it, say it with me. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And you know what? These are boundless. They're limitless. They have no restrictions. Can't have enough. Can you imagine a world with the fruit of the Spirit in your neighborhood, in your schools, in your workplace, in your own church? Can you imagine if we're all operating in the Holy Spirit, what it would look like? Beautiful. So, worshiping God, growing spiritually. Today we're going to learn about loving others. But there's one thing that I want you to do before we get into this message. I want you right now to look around you. I want you to not just look at the few around you. I want you to look across the room. I want you to look in the back. I want you to look in the front. I want you to look over there. I want you to look at everybody in this room. Look around. I'm going to be quiet for a minute, so turn around. Look around and look at the people in this room. Okay? I want to tell you a few things about these people that you just looked at. These people are real. Nobody's fake. Nobody's phony. There's no holograms here today. Okay? You're all real. Do we agree with that? Okay. These people are not perfect. You're all looking at me. I'm not perfect. John can tell you. Okay? Every person in this room brings with them a peculiar type of brokenness. We are a broken people, every single one of us. I prayed earlier that we're all in a state of recovery. We're recovering while we're on this earth. But while we're recovering, we can find the recoverer. He's the only one that can recover us. But he's working in us. It's a process. But we're all broken. And we're all called to love everybody in this room. But the beautiful thing, it's easy to love somebody who you see eye to eye on on spiritual matters and things like that. 
It's not so easy to love people when we go out there. It isn't. It isn't, because I live in a neighborhood just like you do, and you got the not-so-nice neighbors that don't care about you, that, you know, whatever. And there's tension in relationships. There's tension in family relationships. Okay? So not everybody is easy to love. But God is calling us and commanding us to love all people. Anywhere that there's real, imperfect people, wherever they can be found, we are called by God to love them. We don't get to choose whether or not to love people. God commands us to love them. And we're not entering into an optional area here. This is not an option. We are to love. Do we, do we get that? We are to love. Okay, let's keep going. The first thing that I need you to know is that we love others because of God's love for us. This is a responsive thing. God first reached out to us. He first reached out to us. He knows who we are. He knows everything about us. But he first reached out to us. That's what the Nazarenes call prevenient grace in our 16 tenets of our faith. He reached out to us first because of his great mercy and his immense love for each one of us. He reached out to all mankind. Not all mankind is going to respond. That's the unfortunate thing. But we have responded to him if we have this personal relationship with him. But he reached out first. He was the first one. He initiated it. See, it's a chain reaction. The more we are assured of God's love, we have this relationship with him and how much we don't deserve it. There's nothing in my life that deserves it. Nothing. He could have left me on the trash heap, but he didn't. He pulled me out of the trash heap, and he pulled you out too. But the more we are assured of God's love and how much we don't deserve us, it, it takes us here. The more we are humbled and filled with joy. Are you glad that you're saved? Are you glad you're saved? Tell your face so that you can smile and be happy about it. Be filled with joy. It, that means it's overflowing in your life. And somebody ought to see that. But that leads us to the more we are poured out in love for others. If we are humbled and we have this joy because we've been saved and we're no longer doomed for hell, we're waiting for our mansion to be built up there. When God says so, then we can't help but be poured out in love for our people. People. And that leads to this. It leads to worshiping God. It all comes around to worshiping God. And you know what? You cannot worship God without loving other people. You can't. Many of us in this room would say, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I worship God. But you're asking me to love that person? That person who cheated me, hurt me, damaged me, slandered me, said awful things about me, cheated me out of this or whatever, he's mean-spirited, all of that, God called you to love that person. Or you're not truly worshiping him with the pure heart that he needs you to worship him with. Do you get that? You can't separate the two. You cannot separate worshiping God and loving others. You can't separate. They're not two separate things. They're one. Worship God means I love others. Do we get it? This side does? Okay. Do we get it? Okay. Our response to God's loving us just the way we are, you, can't, you don't have to change yourself. Don't even try to change yourself. Let him do it once he's in there. Let him do it. Because you can't figure it out. You can't make it happen. Let him, by his Holy Spirit, work on you. Be the lump of clay on the potter's wheel. Let him spin the wheel and put his thumb in our back and shape us into the piece of beautiful pottery that he needs us to be to share the love of God with somebody else. Amen? Amen. So, 
The command to love. The command. Remember, it's not an option. The command. This is the most basic, straightforward commands in the entire Bible, and it's part of God's great command. So let's look at this scripture. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. That's not a good thing when the Pharisees get together because they're, they are law-centered. They aren't Jesus-centered. They're law-centered. They don't have a heart for God. They have a law. Okay? So when they get together, there's trouble. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Listen to this. To love God means you love others. To love God means if you love God with all of your heart, you're going to love others. And you cannot separate the two. Romans 13 says this, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love your neighbor. Do no harm. We've talked before about the cross beams of the cross, the vertical and the horizontal. And it represents our relationship first with God, this upper, this vertical one, and our relationship with others on the horizontal beam. You get that? Okay. I want you to remember that. I want that to kind of get burned into your mind because the cross is the one that allows us to worship God and to love others. Okay? When it comes to the horizontal or relational commands in the Old Testament, if you want a summary, a, a summary statement for all of these commands, Paul says this, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the Old Testament. And he also says it in the New. Even Leviticus in the Old Testament, listen to this one. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The Lord said that. So you got a grudge against somebody? Are you holding resentment to someone? Are you holding them back? Are you holding yourself back? Because you're not willing to love them. There's a way. We need to keep going so you can get it. But it's super clear here. Love your neighbor. Now, I want to give you two truths about loving others. The very first one is this, the pattern of loving others. We have a pattern established. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. God gives us the pattern. Love like Jesus loved. Give of yourself to others. Give of yourself. Not him, God. He's not worth it. God didn't say that when he sent his son and Jesus went to the cross for him and you. Goes on to say, a new command I give you. Love one another. Well, how do we do that, Jesus? As I have loved you, so you must love another, one another. Just like Jesus did. That's the pattern. 
in the Old Testament, love for others is spelled out in all the rules of the law. And in the New Testament, love for others is embodied in the life of Jesus. Jesus is embodied in us when we invite him into our hearts. Are we getting that? He lives in us. And if love comes in and resides here, love ought to come out. Amen? All right. So, not only do we have the precepts worth keeping, all of those things back there written in the Old Testament are now written on our hearts. So we have that, and we have Jesus. Amen? It's fulfilled through Jesus who resides in us. If we're following Jesus, if we love like Jesus, it means that something, it means something and it's going to look a certain way. So let's see what it's going to look like. Loving in the pattern of Jesus means this. Our love for others makes a difference. The love that we show to one another makes a difference. People are going to see this. John 13 says, by this, all men will know that you are my di disciples, if you love one another. The way we love one another on this earth is going to tell people who don't yet know Jesus, they've got something and I want it. Because they've got peace, they're driven by pure motives, and they love people. No matter if they've been wronged by them or not, they still love them. And that is a testimony to this dark world, that you have the light of Jesus living through you. And it's displayed in how you love other people. Other people will see how we love one another, and they will be touched by God. You let the Holy Spirit do his work. You obey the Lord Jesus Christ and love all people. The Holy Spirit will plant the seeds. He will turn on the light switch when it's time and when it's receptive. In 1 John chapter 3, it says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue or speech, but with actions and in truth. It's one thing to talk about love, and it's another to actually practice love or do deeds, deeds, acts of love. The law, the, we, we roll up our sleeves and we're willing to do whatever it takes to show the love of God. And I'm going to just tell you that we've been, we put a prayer request out for a person in the church that um, needs a vehicle, doesn't have the funds. And just recently found out that it's a car repair. It's not going to be as big as they initially thought. Somebody needs to step up. Is there anybody in here? And I'm not asking for raised hands. You let the Holy Spirit work on you that might be able to help with a car repair. Call me. Call me. We'll connect you. But that's love in action. That is doing more than just saying or saying, I'll pray for someone. When you actually have the ability to, what, what did it say? It said, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Let it be more than just talk. I'm just laying that out there for the Holy Spirit to do his things. It goes on to say this. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. In love. It means that all of our doing, everything that we do, should be loving. And all of our loving should be doing. Did you get that? Everything that we do should be motivated by love in response to his love first to us. So the pattern of loving others makes a difference. And here's what could be the painful part. Our love for others is sacrificial in nature. Sacrificial. It says this in 1 John. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Jesus' love is equated Jesus is laying down his life is equated as love. There's no other reason why Jesus took those nails for you and me. 
It's because he loves us. That's why. He was motivated and moved by love. And it was more than just talk. It was more than just prayer. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane where he was pleading with God, oh, if you can take this cup from me, but nonetheless, your will be done. And he went to the cross because of his great love for us. Be on your guard. Be on your guard. God gave up the rights to himself because he loves us. Jesus did that through the cross. John 15 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for those he loves. I'm not asking you to take that literally. Aren't you glad? I'm not asking you to take the bullet today. I'm not asking you to do that. Be filled with love for your fellow man. But this is what it does look like. And I'm speaking directly to some people here today. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ gave his life for the church. Would you do that for your spouse? Or are you finding everything wrong in your spouse and that's all you're looking at is the negative. Are you willing to love your spouse as Christ loved the church? Are you willing to do that for another person? Any person. Loving others in the pattern of Jesus is sacrificial. And sacrificial love means caring for others when it costs. It's a price. When it costs. Sacrificial love means caring for others at a cost to yourself. If you always have to have the largest portion of ice cream, or if you never change the stinkiest of diapers, when are you going to take the bullet? You know, show yourself approved by the little things. Let that build your faith in God so that you can grow and you can grow and you can love. You can worship and you can love. You can worship and you can love all people. There is a cost. The second truth about loving others is the power of loving others. So we have the pattern. Jesus is the pattern. And now we're talking about the power to love other people. We love because he first loved us. He originated it. We've already learned that. Our love for others is based upon his loving us first. But let's be honest, when it comes to love, we need help. We need help. Especially when our, our boat gets rocked and we're not comfortable. Our lives are full of people, and tomorrow you're going to see that person in the office again, and it isn't going to be easy. But today you get to make a choice. You get to make a choice. We all need help in loving others. God's love for us gives us the power to love others. Okay, the power is at the heart level. Everything with God is at the heart level. Have you noticed that? Everything concerns the heart of who we are when we're dealing with God. This is a power that comes into us and changes us from the inside out. We've sung that song before. He changes us from the inside out. He doesn't change us from the outside in. That'd be easy. But he changes us from the inside out. This was Israel's problem in the Old Testament. Israel had all of the rules and how to love. They had everything. It was line by line, verse by verse, laid out for them. Deuteronomy 22 says, If you see your brother's ox or sheep straying, do not ignore it, but be sure to take it back to him. Missing an ox, missing a sheep, it's in my backyard. I'm going to let him eat up all that long grass out there before I take him back to you, though. No, that's not what it's saying. They had that rule, but God is giving them some basic information on how to love your neighbor here. It also goes on, when you build a new house, make a parapet. A parapet is a fence around your roof 
so that you may not bring the guilt of bloodshed on your house if someone falls from the roof. This was the law. Y'all got fences around your roof line? That's where they used to fellowship up there on the roof. They had flat roofs. And it's saying, protect your neighborhood. Protect your neighbor. Build a fence around it so you don't have an accident happen. Okay? These are just some simple things, odd as they might seem, but practical advice on how to love your neighbor. The law spelled out how to think about other people besides yourself, and that was the Old Testament. They had all the how-tos, but they had no heart. It was something that they could maybe check off, but they weren't conscious of it all the time. So a few chapters later in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, Moses is talking about Israel's future, telling them about God's promise to have mercy on them. And the heart of God's promise is a new heart for Israel. Let's learn something from this. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants, so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. That's the promise of the new covenant. Now, the new covenant through Jesus is this. We have a new heart with a new power. And all believers have this, a new heart with a new power. Before our love can truly extend to someone else, it must flow from a personal heart response to the love that God has for us through his son. Do you get that? First, the personal relationship. Then the power of the Holy Spirit comes through us, and we can love other people. And we can love other people. You can try and skip straight to loving others, and you might be able to do a few good things. But when it comes to real abiding and sustainable love, the kind of power that is needed for that only comes by personal relationship through Jesus Christ, the gift God gave us. Amen? Amen. Now, listen carefully to this, because every unresolved barrier, the little walls that we build up around us to love in our horizontal relationships with others, is a reflection of This is a reflection of how much we don't understand about the vertical relationship. This is based upon this. This goes back to us growing spiritually that we talked about last week. Some of us need to go back, and we need to spend some personal time on the basics. And the basics are reading and studying the Word of God not trying to read through it in 30 days or less. Good luck on that. That would take you a lot of time. Not doing that. Asking the Holy Spirit to illuminate to you what you need to learn from the Word of God so that you can worship and respond to God. And because this is right, you can work on these. He can work on these. These are critical The world out there is not seeing Jesus unless you have a right relationship with God. You need to feed that. And you need to feed that. The real, this real love with God identifies who we belong to. It says in 1 John 3, again, by this is it, it is evident, evident, who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. It hinges on loving God and loving others. Any kind of attitude or posture toward our brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm talking about believers, the family of God, that is not loving is not from God. And it continues in our lives if it's unchecked, and unresolved. And it should be a warning to each one of us. And I know that the Lord is speaking here today. I know that he is here and he's identifying because some of us need to make some changes here. We need to repent. We need to repent. We need to be sorrowful that we're not loving the way God wants us to love. And we need to repent. 
We need to understand more of God's love for us. If all we see in people are the chinks in their armor, you are going to see them. I can assure you, you will see them. If you see what they're not doing well, you will see that too. If that's what you're looking for, if you're looking for the dirt, that's all you're going to see is the dirt. Where's the love in that? You know what that creates is, I'm more spiritual than you. And that's not of God. Because we, we are all loved by God. And he doesn't hold the chinks in our armor against us. He sent Jesus to redeem us from it. Can I hear an amen on that one? Question. Do we want to love others? Or do we want to harbor that hurt that we've had? You know, and we're just holding on to it. Like a big baggage of something, and we're just carrying it around with us. I love you, brother. I love you. You're doing good. You're doing good. Oh, it's getting heavier. It's getting heavier, you know. You I don't like. But I love you because you've done a good thing. You've done a good thing. You're a good person. She's nice all the time. But this person, I'm, I'm, I'm just hanging on to it. And you know what? It's hurting you and it's hurting the kingdom. It says here, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Jesus was referring to the Holy Spirit. This is the power that we need. We can't do it on our own. Marcia can't love on her own. I need the power of the Holy Spirit to love people through me. If I'm not relying on the Holy Spirit, it's not pure love. It's not real love. It's probably um, um, favoritism and preference based upon my own personality. And that's not going to get anywhere. That is not what God desires. So we need the Holy Spirit. Drink in Jesus. Out comes love for everyone by the power of the Holy Spirit. Are we getting this? The power, the pattern of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit. We are commanded to love others if we profess to love God. It is another act of worship. It's a way to express worship when we love others. If you want to love others better, know the love of God more. Know the love of God more. And if everything is great in your life, and you're walking with Jesus, and you're loving everybody else, I got just a little story to tell you. I got a phone call this week from somebody. And she said, I need you to pray. I need you to pray. And I said, okay. And she said, you know that person I was asking you to pray for before? And she's really coming a long way. She's getting engaged in the word. She wants to read the word. She's really asking more questions. I got a Bible for her, and I got her name engraved on it and everything. I gave her the Bible, and she was just so excited that somebody cared enough to give her a Bible, number one. And now she's reading that, and the conversations are beginning to grow more and more spiritually. And I said, so what do you want me to pray for? She said, I want you to pray for me. For who does God need to use next? Who does he want me to reach next? Who is that person? And I said, okay, I'll pray for that. She calls me the very next day. She said, God answered the prayer already. Her name is Jamie. Her name is Jamie. She said, I need you to pray. Um, I said, well, how did that happen? She said, well, she's an old friend of mine, and um, she, we happened to see each other, and we exchanged phone numbers, and she called. And she was saying, um, or um, the person that was talking to me said, um, well, I need to go, Jamie. I've got to finish my Bible study before the group tonight. You're in a Bible study? Open the door. It opened the door. She said, yeah, and I'm going to be finishing that. Oh, I've never, you know, I've really never been to church, and I wasn't, didn't grow up in church or anything like that. And um, so it left the conversation just like that. And the next day, they call again, and they're talking to each other. And they're taking, now, 
How do you study the Bible? What is it that you're doing? It just opened the door. Pastor Les used to say this, wait for the next question. Wait for the next question. You're going to know to take it to the next step when that question is asked because it opens the door. Okay? That's not the end of the story. They're continuing to talk. All of this happened this last week, all in one week. And um, the next phone call she gets, I think it was on Friday, and she said, you're not going to believe what happened in Jamie's life. Okay? Jamie's married to her husband, and they have some kids. Um, husband had some Catholic upbringing, and, but they, they never even talked about going to church. Okay? And one day in the car, um, her husband confronts her and says, I saw uh, a Amazon that um, X amount of dollars. What did you get? Oh, so-and-so's birthday. You spent that amount of money on a birthday present? You know, and so he asked these questions. And she said, well, I bought a Bible for myself. She bought her own Bible. And he said, you bought a Bible? And he said, I didn't know you were interested in a Bible. And it started a conversation in the car on the way home. And he said, are you interested in going to church? They're going to church today. It started with a question less than a week ago. It started. It started. When this phone call says, pray for the next person I need to reach. That God wants to use me to reach. There's more people out there. So I'm going to ask you to do something today. Because you know what? If we don't do something with what we hear, then it's just words. And we leave here thinking, well, that was an okay sermon. Um, Didn't change my life or anything. And you know what? That's not good enough. God wants to change your life. And he's giving us an opportunity every time we gather, every time we bring up his name, for, for him to work in us to make a difference. Because we exist to reach the lost and we exist to grow disciples. So when we wrap up our service today, I'm going to ask you to do something. We have a cross over here. And I'm going to ask you to be bold. I'm going to ask you after this service to get up and write a person's name. First name only. I, nobody takes those off the cross. What this signifies is that you're making a step to be willing to be used by God this week in reaching somebody by putting a name up on that, that tree over there that cross. And I'm asking you to be changed by what you've heard today. Don't just sit there. Don't be unresponsive. How can you be unresponsive when God showed his love for you by taking the nails for you and saving your life? And he's teaching you how to love other people. And it looks like, pray that God will bring me somebody else to reach. Love God that much that you will love others that much. Father God, be with us today. I ask by your red telephone, you call every single person that heard this message today, and you tell them who you need them to reach this week. Help us make a difference. Help it to be sacrificial. Help us to be willing to let go of whatever our plans and agenda were for the day to reach out to someone who is having trouble walking this walk and needs our help because we are the light of the world. Help us, Father God. Identify who that person is and then help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to reach them with the love of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen.